Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Not Alone. I have with us uh, Dr. Anita Prasad. She's the first Indian uh, individual to transition in the EU and primarily in Germany. But I, I think I phrased that wrong. But before I get started, Dr. Prasad, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, hi Darshan. Hello everybody. Thank you very much for this uh, wonderful podcast. Uh, nice to join this discussion. Um, yeah, I've been in Germany since the last 23 years. I was born and brought up in India and uh, mainly in the software and IT services and engineering services business. I hold about four patents and uh, was mainly supporting the Airbus and the other mechanical engineering industry um, in the past. And I'm also a pilot by uh, my <laughs> passion, I would say. And um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I've done quite a lot when I was a man and, um, and um, yeah, so I live with uh, my 17 year old daughter um, and we live in Munich. That's a short, quick introduction. <laughs> um, that, that's a, there's a lot there. And uh, there was a very interesting statement you said, which is when I was a man. So I want to I want to come back and explore that that concept. Um, but before we get started, let's talk. Let's start a little bit from your journey, from uh, how we got to Dr. Prasad as she exists today. So, um, where were you born? You, you said India. Where in India? I was born in Bangalore, India. Okay. Yeah. Uh, very, and go ahead, I'm sorry, please. A, a very orthodox, uh, you know, area called Maleshwaram, a very old town of Bangalore. And it is really amazing. I mean, the kind of culture and the experiences that I got when I was born and especially the kind of uh, the digital journey that we saw, especially our generation, that was really amazing. I mean, I was born, let's say, for example, in a medieval era. And then you imagine that, you know, you're transforming into something. <laughs> That's really amazing. I mean. And, and today we are building the uh, information technology for the future generation and contributing the robotics. I feel proud about it, certainly. Um, I'd been to, Bom uh, to Bangalore when I was probably about 12 or 13. And that was a long time ago. And uh, I haven't been since. All I keep hearing about is it's not, it's nowhere close to the same city anymore. So um, it's, it's one thing seeing that as a visitor, it's even huger seeing that as someone who actually lived there. So, so you grew up in Bangalore as a very conservative city. Um, when did you realize in, in your journey that you don't fit into the same um, paradigm as seen by most people, which is you're born, with, uh, born as a male, you are male, and you must be heterosexual and uh, cisgender, if you will. Talk to me a little bit about your journey there. Um, I'll just take you back a little bit, um, you know, a few more steps behind than what you're exactly expecting. I know what you're sure. expecting. I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> I'm born in a very, very traditional family system. And um, you might be knowing there are several casteism in India. And uh, I was born from a very superior caste and we worship the, um, the famous temples of one to 10 in India, basically. And um, that is the Iyengar community, I would say. Uh, we are basically Tamilians. And uh, we migrated from Tamil Nadu to uh, you know, Karnataka region because of the scholarly uh, possibilities at that time and uh, literature and so on in the Sanskrit area. So the, the four powers migrated. And of course, the, there was a big success uh, earlier stories. And many of the, my family people are, you know, members are, priests, um, they are worshipping in the temples like Tirupati, for example, which is a very famous temple in uh, South India, is being worshipped by my relatives, right? So by, let's say, the descent, we are very superior to be considered, and we are the people who are, who are the only people who are allowed to worship this Lord. <laughs> so I got converted into this right now, so my parents are a bit upset about this whole story. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and when I was born, of course, when I was very little, maybe about two years or three years, I think whenever I started gaining some sort of consciousness, I was more fascinated towards uh, the wonderful dresses the other gender was wearing. <laughs> so somehow I was very attracted towards that. And um, my cousin, who was exactly 19 days elder to me, 
and i was like really fighting you know how how could you wear such uh, beautiful dresses and why am i not able to and in fact i you know i was looking pretty much like a girl i i had a ear piercing um, in, when i was a baby and um, you know my mother also used to dress me as a female um, and we used to go for walking in the evening of course and that was a big enjoyment at that particular time uh, and that was a big privilege i considered because i what my mother told me is you know i was looking really really cute and uh, the whole locality used to stand and then greet me for <laughs> the cuteness or maybe take me away to their home or something like this so that was um, the time what i'm mentioning and taking you back but um, yeah i mean this this did not continue for a very long time in fact the the frock story did continue a bit more further and we went to another very famous indian temple and we were sitting for having the food in the afternoon they were serving it and i spilled the water unfortunately and they were trying to clean up the water unfortunately what happened at that particular point of time the frock went up and the you know the problem was disclosed so suddenly the there was a big shame on my parents because the temple people were very angry saying that hey you said you know this is a this is a girl child but we see this is a boy <laughs> so we have to get this immediately changed so they had to leave in shame of course and that, that was very very bad experience uh, at the time so yeah i mean that was the last moment where i was um, you know when i had a privilege that my parents did allow maybe it was two and a half or three years or something like this and after that it it came to a standstill <laughs> yeah so so that's really interesting so until the age of about 2 two, two and a half you were able to dress up in in as you said frocks dresses if you will you know half i guess yeah yeah and uh it was such a traditional community that uh, as a two and a half year old people were judging um what you were wearing because you you hear about the judgment and you hear about that but it's usually as you get older but uh and, and there are many many stories about that but but you do, do you it's it's pretty young do you remember any of this or is this super young for you i do remember because the temple story was like you know it was a big disappointment for me especially because after that my parents never allowed me to you know yeah that was like a big shocker and i yeah. think there was absolute misfit and somehow i felt like okay there is something happening and i am not happy right now yeah so so your uh, and that's when your your parents knew that this is something you you enjoyed you appreciated you um felt but you were going down a different path and um did you get a chance to dress again uh as as a child or was that yeah i mean see um what happened was i was not allowed from the parents for example after this incident to get into that shoes once again right it was it was a taboo thereafter and they said hey you are a boy you are born as a boy you have to be like this and try to groom but of course you see when you try to push people away what happens is you don't have the kind of concentration that what you need in order to grasp your world looks like you know it's going somewhere differently and you are attracted to something but you're not able to get that in the right direction you're going in different angles you see that that's a big problem and uh, when it comes to uh, let's say learning also you don't have focus you are completely distracted all through right so it is a very big uh, issue which i saw and then uh, eventually i think uh, maybe until um, age i don't know i mean i didn't have any clothes to try on and i was like always feeling jealous and um, i did have a chance of course uh, for a dance performance in the school to change myself when i was like wow this is it you know <laughs> and i didn't want to return the dress but of course my mother said no it has to go back <laughs> so um unfortunately uh, yeah that was the scenario but until i was um let's say i would say crossing my puberty or something that is a time when um you know i saw a lot of upsurge and you know this kind of energy is flowing around and we, i always thought it is basically 
you know, it could be a gender crisis, right? And it started to push it away, ignore it, ignore it, and try to listen to others and try to listen to some beautiful stories. And, you know, um, India has wonderful stories to tell you all the time, right? It can motivate you. There are plenty of gurus available. There are many, many people available to give you that kind of moral support that, hey, you, you cannot be distracted. It can be concentrated and focused and stay really fixed on this, right? So that's the scenario. <laughs> so so that's interesting. So from the age of about two and a half to, mm -hmm. as you said, right before puberty or so, approximately puberty, um, you knew that you felt like you wanted to express yourself mm -hmm. in a different way. Now, one of the key things people always draw the line between is um, gender identity, gender expression, and uh, sexual orientation. That's one of the key sort of three pieces people draw to. Um, we, we aren't going to get to sexual orientation yet because you, you haven't had puberty. So there's no sexual orientation as a child. Uh, gender identity and gender expression are still things that, that you almost were feeling maybe early on. So could you talk a little bit about at that time, did you have a sense of what your gender identity was? Were you clear that you are female at that time? Or was it just, I'm not male or I'm male, but something different? Like what was your experience? Well, I wanted to be a female right from day one because my um, salutation today also is like she or her, right? I'm not, I'm not relating to something in between, um, you know, the, the others do relate because I want to be very close or almost touching the other, um, you know, cis women, for example, not as separated uh, and categorized differently because there are many people who categorize themselves in different directions. So I would like to categorize that way. And uh, yes, I was pretty clear about it, but the uh, taboo uh, that came in in the society and also, for example, if you look at the older part of India, you never had any sort of respect when you had to change. And we were really afraid to go and tell it to anybody because we would be you know, really having a tough time in our families. And especially coming from a Sanskrit background and such things like this, and it's going to be very difficult for our future life, you know. Either you want to adapt this way or, you know, you just need to leave the house. So the, the, there were only two paths available. <laughs> so that's kind of interesting. So you knew that you wanted to be a woman, or at least you are a woman, um, as early as you can remember. Is that fair? Okay. Um, and expression, you, it's unclear what expression you wanted. However, mm -hmm. it is clear that the expression you wanted, um, would depend on, um, what society would allow you at that time. Um, now I find it interesting between the ages of two and a half to about, like I said, a 13, 14 plus or minus, um, in India, you have, for example, the Hijra community. You have uh, the the um, you, obviously you have women. How did you sort of? I mean, you you came from as you said a high caste, and you you were very well respected. Um, we've had uh, individuals who uh, who've come on, um, and and you I think you you know her. Celia came on, and she's talked a little bit about how Hijras are looked down upon in India. Um, and, and, uh, there was, there was a whole conversation about what that balance looks like. So I guess my question for you is, did you have any, um, access and, and when I say access, like just seeing the Hijra community and what was your, your reaction to, am I like this or am I different? I, Cause you said, I, I want, I identify, I feel like a cis woman. So what, could you talk a little bit about that experience and was there a detraction if you will? Exactly. So let me tell you, Hijra, um, I don't know, I mean, there, there were some uh, hot speed spots which I had to update the whole society. Hijra is a religion, if you look at it in India. Oh, I right? didn't know that. Interesting. Yeah. When I didn't know this. <laughs> <laughs> when I started to know a transition, only then I knew it, right? They are a religion. They are basically existent since last, I don't know, seven, eight thousand years. Right uh, now, now and then, let's say 6,000 BCE is what it dates back to. Right, so India had an inclusive culture for transgenderism completely, 
and this is the only uh, let's say for example um, culture um, or or let's say the civilization or the religion uh, which can say that uh, look we have an inclusive society and if you look at it in the previous past everybody were the same and there were no discriminations even in the past before the invaders entered india right the moguls first who came they destroyed a lot of libraries and literatures and so on and also the colonial you know what happened you know it the world knows about it and uh, the world is not sorry for it unfortunately <laughs> so we are still going through this whole topic but even after 75 years of independence the literature and the inclusivity what was existent when the invaders entered india has lost it right i mean they don't know this can the present population do not know anything about it right so they are totally uh, you know in a, in a shadow today and in fact i'm writing a book about this to come out to explain what the inclusive how the inclusive society looked like in the past and what were the practices and including the yoga practices and the other um, you know rituals and so on which they were trying to practice other than the hijra community itself because if you see the lord shri krishna for example the indian god could shift as radha and radha could shift as shri krishna yes i didn't know that, I did know that. interesting and um, you know many people are afraid saying that you know once i take the name mohini they say oh no this mohini is uh, a demon right i mean mohini is an avatar from shri krishna who turned to be a female and who um, you know marries aravana uh, and that makes the mahabharata battle win so there are so many topics that the community doesn't know about this in fact my main area is or, or let's say the goal is to spread the kind of awareness and especially in india to tell these people look how the inclusive society looked like in the past and what are the blunders that this particular society adopting the colonial mindset and the regulations that they came up with they changed this almost 60 years ago and you guys didn't change it until recent past and you had to go through a, a real amount of pain and the torture with all these transgender or lgbt q community plus community that's really horrible and look at scotland they are far ahead look at uk they are far ahead but we are somewhere you know i don't know where we are right i mean the india especially so right. this is this is the message i would like to pass over and this basically scares many many people they are not able to express themselves and they uh, the present society is living in the shame right they feel it is shame because hijras do prostitutions hijras do begging hijras do so many other topics because that is their living or it is their interest and in fact one um, one of my uh, you know connect from india she's running a ngo in uh, mumbai she came back to me and uh, approached me asked me hey i i would need your help in fact you put in a word i would like to put at least 200 women in um, you know in corporates i said look these women um, even if you try to take it they may have an underemployment created for themselves because they will stand in a signal light they will just clap once they get 10 or 100 rupees on the spot and um, you know it's a very easy life in an hour you have made some 1000 rupees and then in a day you have made some quite an amount of uh, balance bank balance and in the evening you want to you know go and entertain others you still have a big numbers making out from this and why do you think that these people are going to listen to you and then try to change for what and for whom so there has to be some sort of a different attraction coming in to change these people right i mean i'm not criticizing it but it's a social problem in india right now because somebody pushed these people for doing this beggary and prostitution and so on it is really heartbreaking for me to see that you know these people are in a wrong direction and uh, they need a help and transgender women are not hijras and transgender women need not have to follow their culture in fact i asked many gurus went ahead and then asked them look hey guru i'm born in let's say ayengar community right i'm i'm the supremacy of whatever and my body gets burnt after i'm dead right and in in the hijra community you burn them in the night 
yeah. or you bury okay. them in the neck because they are units. They have a different practice altogether, right? So they understand. work in a different angle altogether, and they worship uh, different lords. They have a guru. They have a system. Yeah, I mean they are doing wonderful job. For example, uh, a person like me thrown off, thrown out of this top class community, and I need help today. I just go to Hijra community and I request them, and they have such a big open heart to welcome me, and then they say, "Look, you can be a part with us." Right? That is how the earlier conversions have also taken place. That many have run away from the homes, and they had to do it because probably I. held it back with some sort of concentration for example i'll give you the the uh, a quick method and how i actually work this out right please so um i just refer to one of the uh, story which is from mahabharata right so um i'm sorry i i there is no other story that i can give you as a reference because this is a wonderful story that i would like to give it i am not preaching any religion or i am trying to promote hinduism or indian you know people should not mistake me for this so uh, the mahabharata in the final war you see this arjuna is standing on the battlefield and his own gurus or the teachers and his relatives and other people are standing on the opposite side and he asks lord krishna how do i basically concentrate right, right. now how do i fight yeah right krishna lord krishna says practice makes one person perfect and concentration makes one person perfect so this was a philosophy which was taught to me when i was not having the focus and the concentration that this is the philosophy that these people taught me in order to make me concentrated right i mean just if you don't understand read it again if you don't understand read it again if you don't understand come back to me i'll probably explain to you in a little bit different way that you you can try to understand right so this is how i actually th- this was my childhood i was never a top class scorer in my class <laughs> right. until i mean i was like maybe in the pre university or so i started scoring a little bit better until then i was like completely shattered <laughs> so so i i thank you for the education i didn't realize that the hijra community was actually its own religion by itself uh i've always thought that they they still use the same gods and the like but what i'm hearing is it's a different sect so it it uses uh it has its own rituals and and the like um the other term that i've growing up in india i grew up in bombay as well and um the the other term that i have come across often uh not often but enough is when you talk about the indian gods there's the concept and you actually refer to it uh semi refer to it in the concept of mohini but uh there there is the concept of ardhanareshwar which is the half man half woman um so, which to me speaks to the presence of gods who are half man half woman um you you actually have a strong religious background so you can run circles around me with with this idea so could you talk a little bit about what that how how that um concept feeds into inclusivity in india when were you aware of this as you were reading about it um did this in any way feed your soul that are you in many ways the um you, you have both parts of it inside you and you eventually realize that the the feminine part is stronger if you will for lack of a better term or that was never a thought in your head you were very clear that you were female exactly see uh, i'll tell you the uh, both parts clubbing together and working it out that's a different concept the adhana is a okay um, for example i'll tell you i forgotten the name of this uh, saint um, mm-hmm. who who always worships lord shiva and um not uh, was, not right no sorry i'll i'll, <laughs> I'll go back bye bye same thing is happening to me as well so this uh, this uh, saint is actually worshiping shiva so much and he's praising lord shiva actually he falls in love with shiva for example right and lord parvati who is the wife of shiva is standing next to it and then witnessing that there is a problem that someone is falling in love with my husband <laughs> and he's a man right and then they come and um, let's say for example uh, stand together and this guy you know makes a round circle right and uh, also you know they, 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 there is a different story that goes and they they merge together also he makes a round and uh, he he goes under the feet and all those things and there's a big story behind it so 
uh, this is how it actually happens. So this is the Ardhanari Shura concept, right? I mean, the, 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 this is basically to show the world that, you know, the, the you, two people can join. I mean, the, the male and female can join together to uh, support each other in, in a crisis. Mm, I didn't realize that. Okay, interesting. So, I saw it differently. Can, yeah, I mean, um, and, and also like, for example, um, there is a lot of uh, misunderstanding and miscommunication with regards to a lot of other transgenderism when it comes to the, uh, the mythology uh, concepts. And we, uh, you know, the very important topic is certain things have to be digged out so deeply that this has to be clarified to our own uh, society in, in a proper va- manner. That's what I feel like. And uh, yes, I mean, the concept of, let's say, uh, man and woman, yeah, there is there is a characteristics that we do possess, right? And uh, there, are, there are some uh, studies that show uh, that the MRI scans are coming out, let's say, for example, when you feel like a woman, your brain is adjusting to it completely, right? There are plenty of scientific studies which have taken place and I don't need have to spend my time on it. So this is the kind of uh, background what I would uh, like to suggest that, you know, th- th- there is a depth of information that, you know, one has to collect in order to uh, make things much more clearer. Okay. So, so let's go back to your life. We talked a little bit about some concepts that um, were interesting to explore. But now, now we, we talked about you um, starting out, you, you sort of not being able to explore who you are but between the ages of two and a half to around puberty. What happened around puberty? What made you um, realize uh, or what, what, what opportunities did you get to explore who you actually are? During the puberty, I would say that you know I was I was only trying to cross dress whenever the time and the possibility permits, right? Mm-hmm. And I was enjoying it, and I was I, and that was like you know very hidden, you know places. It was never been able to uh, be expressed outside the world, so that was very very difficult scenario in India. And um, I, I did that uh, for quite a while whenever uh, I, I, I was alone at home, for example. But most of the time I was trying to exert myself and try to deviate. These were the tricks that I was using in order to stay away from this uh, kind of uh, attraction that would drag me in. The physical exertion, I would say engage in some games or I was like taking the bike, the bike, and then going all around the south, southern part of India on a bicycle. So these kind of st- uh, you know strange things I've done in my life, <laughs> of course, that contributed a lot for fitness and um, you know my health, of course. And a little bit later point of time, you know, during let's say for example my first years of my graduation, I got in contact with a lot of philosophers, and uh, which basically dragged me in further more into lots of other uh, thinking processes and um, that time you know the concept of let's say marriage and no marriage and such kind of things do existed and many people were let's say real masters of yoga and they were teaching yoga and I was also privileged uh, to be a good friend of one of the biggest gurus of India and we used to meet in the forest of uh, Karnataka region I don't want to name the (laughs) guru today He's a multi-billion dollar guru and you can refer to it, of course. And, you know, we were all debating, sitting and debating and discussing on so many topics. And they used to share the kind of knowledge of what they have and the kind of yoga and the practices that we were trying to do and so on. So this basically uh, kept the kind of diversion. And that was the time when um, I was introduced slowly in phase-wise basis towards the um, you know, the, the meditation, the yoga, and also trying to hold. And uh, in yoga, you call it as kayasthirya, first of all, that you, you try to concentrate and bring the concentration with your whole body and the mind by doing this. And then you have various other different steps and uh, try to do this. Um, yeah, this is the uh, quick background of, you know, uh, how I try to deviate and say, for example, gender dysphoria was not a dysphoria, it was like a gender crisis. And I'll tell you the story a little bit more, what happened at my later point of time, right? Um, yeah, I mean, I joined uh, my work course after my uh, universities and master degree completions and so on. 
got married and um, uh, i was in the dot com bubble the first it bubble <laughs> in india so i had the silicon valley birth and so on right i mean it was really amazing uh, my journey and um, yeah i mean after the marriage also the uh, crisis was very high right i mean i i did express to my wife many many times that i do have this and i used to you know stay in a different closet and <laughs> so those kind of things were happening frequently but the uh, need of the hour was to focus on the life career growth etc and that also went on and this was ignored as gender crisis all through and unfortunately i did not even realize what i was trying to do a uh, damage for myself until 2018 and when i you know saw a bit of upsurge in terms of my anxiety levels and also the blood pressure going up and so on i said okay probably this is coming up yeah late 40s uh, nearing 50s and you have a problem enjoy and you know welcome to the club so that was the <laughs> that was the area uh, we thought first but it was not the case and um, suddenly the next year it started going up and up even further took me to hospital put me on the icus many many times ambulances came i was very famous soon in germany in munich and in uh, freising different different places all the people were like okay uh, the ambulance staff and the doctors became my friend <laughs> they said hey nothing is wrong with you why are you coming back and forth again you know <laughs> you have anxiety problem do you do you control on your food do you meditate do you do that do you do this and you know come on you are just asking me this this kind of question who know really knows the topics but nothing helps trust me and uh, i was referred to a psychiatrist and that is the time when i had to figure out this is nothing but gender dysphoria to address this immediately with a medication and i had to do a transition in terms of the uh, you know hormone replacement replacement therapy immediately and this took a lot of energy and uh, you know but not from my side and you know what happens the traditional families and the kind of setup and the environment that you have finally gave up on me <laughs> that was the outcome yeah um and there's so much you just discussed there's so much to explore in 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 what you discussed um do you mind if we start a little bit early on and then explore that a little bit um so so you you grew up in india you uh you went through puberty um you was you you spent a lot of energy uh trying to fight the the gender crisis as you put it um when did you realize cuz as you said you were very well respected in india when did you realize you want to come to germany i came for uh, working here basically i did not relocate by interest in fact i was engaged with one of the top class engineering services house in india um, at that time you know they requested me to be the uh, head of european union uh, territory so that made me to come to germany and to head this uh, activities and the operations itself i did fairly well at that particular time yeah but in a lot of- <laughs> and and when when you came over um w- did you f- were you dating anyone at that time um was there was married oh you already married yeah okay so I, let's go ahead i'm sorry sorry for that of course in the beginning i wasn't and then at a later point of time i did okay so so if you were married wh- what d- what did you tell your wife your wife to be did you know about this crisis or did you not completely understand where you were crisis i thought it's just a you know it's it's like an upsurge of energy right i mean i never ever realized because uh, what is available today online is not was not available earlier and there were no youtubes or there were no media there was nothing and um, yeah i mean i had fortunately uh, hotmail and yahoo accounts <laughs> you know right the, the, fantastic but it, it, this kind of knowledge and the information is not available on the electronic media or we could go openly and discuss with anybody because even if you imagine europe europe itself was in a you know let's say earlier era right i mean you couldn't discuss with anybody nobody would accept you right 
So this was the kind of issue and uh, I, I always ignored it rather than telling it to others saying that, okay, it is just an energy which just comes and goes, leave it. That was right. the approach. And, and um, just, so you're past puberty at this point, you're getting married. Um, how do you identify sexually? Do you identify as a cis, uh, as a straight woman? Do you identify as a um, gay woman? Do you identify, how, how do you identify now? This woman. No, no, I'm sorry. Should I, I, I do you, do you, I, I, the gay, I'm, I'm asking, uh, do you, are you attracted to men? Are you attracted to women? Uh, I was, uh, let's say, for example, when I was in my uh, manlyhood, right? I was naturally attracted to a female. I was never attracted to a male. I was running away, far away <laughs> from that uh, stories. But uh, after my conversion, I realized that I'm an asexual. Okay. Okay. Uh, you know, difference that I've seen. I don't like anybody now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. So, so, so at that time you were, uh, you identified as uh, drawn to men and now you're asexual, if you will. Um, but so, so you moved to Germany at some point you had, you had a child. I, I think you said it was a daughter. Yes. In 2006. Yes. Right. Okay. So, so she's almost, she's about 15 or 18, almost plus or minus, right? 17, I would say. 17, 17. Okay. Uh, I'm not good at adding as, as an engineer, you're going, I can add this in the back of my, like, it doesn't take me anything. Um, so you, how has she responded to all of these changes that what she thought was her dad was going through? Uh, she was absolutely accepting me. I had no issues at all from her because she was educated in this area and she had her own schoolmates who were identifying themselves as something. And uh, nearly almost like 20 or 30 percent of her class identifies each other as someone else. Right. <laughs> so this is not a, a shocker for her when I went and yeah. told, look, this is the situation. But uh, she also did not ask me any sort of question like this and why did you hide or whatever. But I, I myself didn't know that to tell her any sort of story. Right. That's a different right. thing. But uh, yeah, I mean, she accepted and she's like, okay, fantastic, no problem. But my traditional wife has an issue with it. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, so this, you, you had a crisis in 2018. So I assume you had to tell your wife, your, your wife then, is that correct? Uh, she she is still my wife. That means we will be divorcing pretty soon. I'm going heading to India tomorrow for the same reason to sign up the papers. Right. <laughs> um, which is difficult, and I'm sorry. Uh, whether or not it's for um, for whatever reason, it's still a sad, very difficult period. So I um, my condolences. Having said that, um, you you. Uh, so, so you, how did you have to tell her? How did that conversation go for you? Well, I had to tell her once the psychiatrist identified what the issue was, right? I had to tell her, look, this is the uh, behavior pattern of mine earlier since marriage. She, she has seen it almost like 20 years now. It's nothing to hide with her. And then I told her, look, this is uh, to be identified as a psychosomatic disorder and gender dysphoria classified. And I have to shift into a new gender. And uh, would you accept me? And uh, she was shattered, of course. She wasn't um, in her you know, full mind to <laughs> accept me there. And she did discuss with her family, but you know, um, the kind of knowledge what India provides with their own family and the culture that matters, um, no matter what you have done in your life, what you have achieved and how you actually maintained your relationships and what sort of a royal princess life she lived uh, with me, you know, that, that never mattered in this situation because they feel it is not an, um, you know, a, a situation where they can accept in a different direction that, um, you know, this is uh, a go ahead scenario, right? I mean, it is a taboo still. And it is only meant for the cheap people. And um, my father-in-law asked me a question. Oh, you see the people who are standing in the traffic lights. And, you know, I, I, I told him, are you interested in terms of getting your 
um, let's say a bit of knowledge in this particular area. If you, if so, I would tell you what it is. They said, no, we are not interested to listen to this at all because we don't want um, this kind of, let's say, um, <laughs> son-in-law or daughter-in-law. We possibly would like to discontinue uh, our relationship. So, yeah, I mean, I felt like a tissue paper. Right, right. I'm sorry. Um, so your your. So it, it felt emotionally very difficult to start losing those relationships with people you are extremely close to, whether you're talking about your 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 soon to be ex wife, whether you're talking about your in laws who. I assume you you treated them. They were like family. Um, how has your your own family reacted to this? My family is also not yet um, accepting it hundred um, percent. I mean, they are they are now making a lot of research. First, they thought, yeah, I mean, in India this is very very common. First, they thought somebody did a black magic, and they went into you know this. Uh, first, I was you know made to practice what they're saying and so on. And, uh, you know, we have a big respect to our parents. We don't uh, push them away. And um, with that, you know, I always obeyed whatever they said. I always respect them with this. But after that, they started slowly realizing that, okay, um, this is not a scenario which can bring a cure to my son. But my mother is actually even now looking at the son who went from India, the same son to come back. Right. That's a, that's that's not going to be possible. That's why I told her that you know, look, your son is not going to be returning. But yes, I mean, son is going to return in a different form altogether. Uh, but she requested me when I wanted to go into India this time to present at least as a male for a day <laughs> that she likes me. You know, I never said no to her. I said yes. I mean, I'm I'm, I'm going to be supportive for you. They're not an issue at all. And uh, yeah, I mean, this is a very uh, painful journey, I would say that, you know, what I'm actually undergoing, but um, they are slowly starting to accept, they are starting to starting to, let's say, for example, understand what this transgenderism is, and why it comes in. And I have also given them plenty of literatures and information. But, uh, you know, uh, for a very traditional uh, parent, uh, it's not something what you would like to go through, uh, you know, those literatures from the sun, for example, and try to digest and try to say, okay, I accept you. It's not something which is happening because they've seen seen me for 48, 49 years to be as a male, right? Yeah. Uh, they still see that. Uh, and um, I, I just cannot, you know, disappoint them. They're in their 80s, uh, mid 80s, and I cannot really challenge old age people. And uh, this is also a sentimental scenario for me that, okay, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm slowing down the transition, or probably I, I had grown my hair, I cut it off because I'm going to India, I probably can change it a little bit more, look manly to that. You know, all the things I'm trying to do my best. Let's see. Do you have any siblings? Yeah, my brother, and uh, they also did not accept. My brother and my sister-in-law, they are also, they said no. <laughs> so for you, your, your entire life right now is your daughter. Mm -hmm. um, so she's both the one you love, possibly the most, but the one who is also your support. How how has that helped your relationship with her? With her, we are always very close friends. I mean, I never saw her as uh, right from a kid. You know, I never, um, I was never an Indian parent. I would say in that terms. I hope you understand what I mean. I never put <laughs> her for anything. I I give her the hundred percent freedom, and she has been a top performer. I never ever ask her for anything. That's that's the uh, you know blessing that I have uh, in disguise. And she's a wonderful kid so far, and uh, she's been able to fulfill all my, uh, let's say, imaginations. And she's so sweet and adorable. Of course, I'm, I'm pretty happy with that uh, situation. <laughs> and of and course, you know, moving ahead, um, she's going to be in uh, under her mother's custody. That's what she has uh, said for a while, because 
there's a big pressure coming up from um, my wife's family. Uh, so they're going to be living together. Does that mean you don't get to see her as much? I may get to see her whenever, uh, uh, you know, I travel or maybe whenever I wish I could make a telephone call and we could meet. There's no problem with it. But of course, um, you know, uh, she's going to live for some more time with her mother. <laughs> so right. just for you know, whatever, I don't know. Right. Um, how has work been? Uh, could you say that again, please? Um, how has work been as part of this transition, part of, part of this changeover? Work has been um, pretty stressful to me at this point of time because uh, once the gender dysphoria kicks in, it actually spoiled my whole uh, digestive system because my body became alkaline. That, that's the uh, topic where I had to get frequently admitted to the uh, ICUs and uh, get treatment on. And, um, you know, I had severe uh, problems and no food was able to be digested. And uh, any food that I take in, it has a different sort of an effect which came in uh, uh, as well, right? So um, this made me go weaker, not to focus on the customers and the people and not able to trans, uh, that's a travel, which is which is a very key part of mine, uh, my, my business because I'm a front end customer facing role and it's very difficult because I do the dealings with the customers to sign the contracts or doing anything, everything, so I could provide uh, manpowers in the staff or to take the projects and the discussions. So it's very difficult and um, you know I had to give away a lot many things or to give away this role to someone else. And uh, as well, family did play a very dirty role because they didn't like it and you know, it went ahead in the market to damage my name as well in a different direction. So it was a very unfortunate incident uh, that took place. And um, I was not imagining that, um, you know, someone whom you loved and, you know, whom you did so many things in your life uh, can also do like this one day. So because it's it's a frustration uh, which came out, right? So which is uh, very bad, uh, what I feel. But I cannot help because I need to uh, rebuild certain things. What is destroyed is destroyed. Um, but uh, to me, the only thing which lies is the confidence and the capability, what I have that no one can steal. And then I can always stand back whenever I can. Um, that's very difficult. What I, what I hear you struggling with is you've built an entire life, life and it's all been taken away from you, but it's the price you are willing to pay for you to exist the way you need to exist for your own health, if you will, for lack of a better term. Um, the the are, are you generally a friendly person? Do you have a lot of friends? How, how have they responded? A lot of friends and um, some of them left, um, especially, you know, I, I wouldn't uh, degrade this, but my friends who came from the Middle Eastern region did not like this. They just said goodbye. <laughs> but the other friends uh, who are there, of course, they are. They have been quite supportive, and they try to understand it. And they also try to, uh, let's say, at least give me some good words. If not, I, I, I don't take any kind of, uh, let's say, kind of any sort of support from anyone. So I was very clear, and then at least some good words and stay in touch. And they are. Uh, you know, asking me to come and also present in their universities where they are professors or, you know, somewhere they have connections. And they also asked me to provide some interviews for the televisions in India and so on. The moment they heard that you know, I'm coming, they said, like, hey, I will organize one, two, three, four. And they packed my complete couple of days. Uh, <laughs> and that's that's a, a wonderful thing from my friends. And they said, we are not going to leave you alone. The moment you are here, please let me know. So that's just really wonderful from uh, my friends, I would say. And these, uh, I mean, I don't have, I mean, like 20, 25 years and um, we have hardly met after that, but uh, look at the kind of love that these guys bring on the table. And the 20, 25 years whom I did some, something for them, they can just throw you like a tissue paper and walk away. That's, yeah. that's something which is uh, pretty disappointing. And I think yeah. this for an awareness and you know this is the reason why I started this awareness program I write a lot of literatures and I provide this on LinkedIn if you see this and um, you know a lot of research goes on on this particular subject 
I invite everybody, at least I don't want, at least whatever happened to me, if I can save even one family, I'm happy. Many, many could be saved, but if somebody is following and reading my post, at least one could save their uh, you know, family and life, they should be happy enough. Yeah. And I should. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm, I'm glad. Um, there, there was one other triumphant thing that you've done. The, the, I mean, the, you've done a series of triumphant things, um, mm-hmm. but you educated the Indian embassy on, on the process and the education of what gender dysphoria feels like. Could you talk a little bit about that process? How did, when did this happen? What did you have to talk to them about? A little bit more. Uh, they didn't know uh, a basic difference between a transgender and um, what the Indian third gender is, for example. And I get very irritated when someone says third gender. You could rather say it more nicely, you know, biological sex. That would be more apt. Or if I'm relating, for example, to a cis women or someone is relating to a male, you would rather say it as that, you know, that that's something which I see uh, things doesn't happen. And the uh, Indian external ministry uh, today, unfortunately, has one process which they say, even though the Honorable Supreme Court of India abolished the Article 377, the Indian external ministry is still sitting in the kind of mindset, even though they, I, let's say I identify as cis women, I need to be operated in order to change my name and also gender. So this is um, you know, a real tough situation. If I do not want to do operation, for example, I need to go to court in order to tell them, look, why I don't want to get it operated and why identify as so-and-so and I need to get a court order and furnish it. And this is a very difficult procedure. Right. I mean, um, I had to walk through these guys to tell them a lot many things and what exactly uh, gender dysphoria is and how does it come in my case, how it came, what happened. And um, they said, yeah, we are really nice. I mean, we, we, we are so happy. But, you know, unfortunately, um, our government is uh, very restricted in terms of the mindset and it is governed also by a very restricted uh, group of um, you know, people, and we cannot, um, you know, openly come and appreciate this or invite you for a podium. But of course, we are very happy to know this information and support you only your case. In case somebody comes in the future, I will support you for this. And you know, it is diplomatism, again. So this is the way I saw it. But of course, educated some of them. And that that brings a lot of uh, peace for me on that particular region. That yes, I mean, there is going to be change. <laughs> Yeah. Um, as far as you can tell, is the change in Germany now because of the conversation and the education you provided, or is it Europe-wide because of the education you provided to the Indian external ministry? One consulate because the other consulates are not interested because the government is, um, you know, let's say too religious or I don't know where this religion is. Religion in, in Hinduism is free, uh, all-inclusive society. And I don't understand these people come and t- tell us that, okay, it is all, you know, we do not accept transgenderism. This is something very strange what I feel. And uh, they come and, uh, you know, pose saying that this is a taboo. Uh, who defined this term, first of all? You know, this is my question. And when I sent a request, trust me, on this Consulate Generals of uh, India uh, on the LinkedIn, they were absolutely adamant and they did not even accept it. They didn't even care. And then I telephone to them and say, you know our government, you know our governing body, you know, please excuse us. This is not the way, you know, this is the, definitely not the way, isn't it? If you, if you are supportive, you are interested in learning something new, and you are recruiting transgenders in your own, uh, let's say, organizations, but you don't want to learn about them. Isn't this a damage that you are creating for your own organization, the way you function? And, and they didn't respond. Absolutely. And uh, I would probably meet with somebody in the ministry, definitely, you know, sooner or later, I would like to debate. But yeah, this is going to be my open topic. We have to change this, guys. I'm, I'm committed to this. Uh, it's, it sounds like a, a wonderful conversation to have and one that will keep evolving um, as, as we get more information, as, as we educate more people. So, Dr. Prasad, before we, we let it go, um, 
if people want to reach you to find out more, how can people reach you? They can reach me on LinkedIn. I'm available on LinkedIn, Dr. Amita Prasad. So you can reach me there. Or you can also connect me on um, Instagram. Instagram is Anita underscore Germany. And certainly I'd be very pleased to connect to everybody. And then, uh, of course, extend this kind of information. Uh, whatever I'm writing, I'm just writing. I'm making my research. I'm writing my studies. Um, like this, I'm conversing every day with some doctors or discussions is going on. And my research papers are also coming out. So it's it's going to be a wonderful story. And I hope that in, soon in the future, we'll have some more books to be shared with the public. And uh, that's where I feel much more confident. And I'm I'm really looking for it. I'm now underconfident. I would say that I'm wanting to be more confident in this area. <laughs> well, well, we're wishing you the best uh, to both for the confidence and for the books and for the research that's coming out. So. Dr. Prasad, it was a wonderful interviewing you. Thank you so much for taking the time and good luck on your trip and on your travels. Thank you.